study to hear how aging changes the way we see and taste food. These changes really impact the ability of older adults to receive the nutrition they need to survive and thrive. I would like you to meet our lunch and keynote speaker, Melissa Rommel. Melissa received her Bachelor of Arts degree in Dietetics from the University of Northern Colorado. After completing her dietetic internship at St. Louis University, she went on to complete a double master's in nutrition and dietetics and also a master's in public health, both from St. Louis University. Melissa has professional experience as a clinical dietitian for a large long-term care center. Currently, she holds an instructorship appointment in the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics at SLU. Please welcome Melissa, Melissa for a wonderful keynote speech. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm glad I'm not tied to the podium because it's not really short friendly. So, um, I'm Melissa and today we're just going to talk about some of the issues that are seen in the elderly community um, related to nutrition, some reasons why there are issues and concerns, and then hopefully you can take away some implementable strategies that you can use in your facilities to improve the nutrition, unless your facility has no problems with malnutrition. Anybody? Okay, good. Um, and hopefully you enjoyed your lunch. Try not to nod off. Um, but if you do, just stand up and run around in a circle and then move on. Okay. I have no relevant financial disclosures. Um, and I'm acting like this is a microphone, so I apologize. I will use it as a clicker too, but it has dual function for me. Um, general concerns, malnutrition. So if you look to the statistics, it's pretty staggering that 54 to 85 percent of our long-term elderly care residents are malnourished. That's not good. Especially because malnourishment can just kind of attenuate a lot of chronic disease and that general cascade ball roll of downward um, health overall. Unintended weight loss. Raise your hand if you have unintended weight loss as a concern in your facility. Only a couple? Wow. Okay, good. Not good. We'll address it. Um, pressure ulcers and dehydration. So what alters the diet? Why do elderly individuals have such a problem with getting the nutrition that they need? So physiologically, everything kind of slows down. I'm sure you are all aware of this, um, but tastes do change. Taste buds change. Appetite decreases, and that's for many reasons, whether it's physiological or just um, from a host of medications that they're taking. Uh, poor dentition, dysphagia, limited eyesight, memory impairment, depression, change in lifestyle. These individuals were working and um, having a robust, robust social life, and now they're maybe in a long-term care, and a lot of their uh, needs are being met by others, and they can't care for themselves. Uh, social life has been changed, and uh, medications. A lot of the elderly are taking more medications than is actually needed, and Unfortunately, those medications can interact with one another and they can have nutrient interactions as well. So why have their food selection patterns changed? Um, a big one, of course, is just a loss of appetite. Um, taste changes again, dental problems, um, loss of mobility. If you're not able to eat like you used to, eat, then, you know, some people just kind of get turned off to food as it being a whole lot of problems as opposed to something that was used to be enjoyable. Um, special diets. So 
if an individual has to be on some type of texture modification or thicken liquids. Um, that can be a daunting task for them and the staff involved, but also influences their appetite. Psychosocial. Um, eating alone, they don't, maybe their spouse has since died, maybe their friends are no longer living. Those are all things that impact eating. And if you think about eating for yourself, it's a social fun thing. If you don't have anybody to eat with, maybe you don't eat as much. So we know that energy and nutrient needs are changed in the elderly. So as physiological function kind of slows down, so does the basal energy expenditure, what is uh, noted as BEE, it goes down. So you have less um, nutrient or energy needs, if you will, um, and less lean body mass. So the problem that we see is a lot of individuals are having an increased fat mass and less lean body mass. So that impacts their nutrition and it also impacts their mobility. If they have more fat and less lean body mass, they're less able to utilize the muscles that they have on board to be mobile. Um, and they have more issues with uh, nutrition. Also influence, um, by chronic disease. Raise your hand if you have uh, residents that only have one chronic disease. Okay, so they have a lot of stuff going on. So give them the benefit of the doubt and recognize that um, it, it's not as easy as just eating. There's a lot of other things that are going on. Um, and when you are evaluating, maybe they're not getting enough, um, taking in consideration everything that they do have going on that could affect their nutrition is important. So these estimated needs are based out of the 2015-2020 dietary guidelines that were recently released. Um, did those numbers kind of shock anyone? Raise your hand. No? Okay. How many calories are adults supposed to be getting in a day, in general? Think back to if you were looking at a nutrition facts label and those diets are based off of how many calories in a day? 2,000. How many calories are they recommending for the elderly patients to get? Not that few, right? 2,000 calories is a decent amount of calories, and if we know that they have all of those other um, issues going on, we can understand why it's so hard for them to get in enough nutrition. So talking about macronutrients, so carbohydrates, um, hopefully the fad diets don't kind of string along into the long-term care, but I'm sure that residents may be asking about um, some of the fad diets. Low, low carb, no, no low carb, no gluten free unless they have celiac disease. Um, but carbohydrates, whole grain carbohydrates, should really um, comprise about 55 to 60 percent of an elderly's diet. Um, and this is not only to just maintain bodily function, but it's also to help the body not pull from those lessened muscle stores and make glucose for the body. We, don't, we want to preserve muscle mass as much as possible. So fiber. While we know adults don't get enough fiber in general, the elderly population is, is in the same boat. They're not getting enough, enough fiber. Um, but if they're in a long-term care facility that's not providing foods that have fiber, it's not necessarily their fault either. Um, raise your hand if your facility has whole grain, bread, brown rice, pasta, none, two, three, four. So one reason, of course, that locations don't have whole grain products is the cost is a little bit higher. 
But if we're not providing enough fiber with through whole grains, there's a lot of micronutrient vitamins in those whole grains besides the fiber that the residents are missing out on. So that's a little bit of a disservice to them. Um, and total dietary fiber, just broken down, um, is dietary fiber, so fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and then added fiber. So added fiber would be those products like fiber one. No, a brownie usually doesn't have fiber in it, unless it's a pureed black bean brownie, which probably isn't what it is. So fiber one, those types of products have added fiber. So you can add fiber to a product. Um, the concern with fiber, of course, is our elderly residents aren't as mobile. They're not drinking as much. Their digestion has slowed down. Bum, bum, bum. Issues. Digestion issues. Pain. If they're, you know, say, we stopped all white flour, you know, regular bread, regular pasta, and we went all whole grain. And that's all we're giving our residents. You're going to have a lot of issues in the bathroom and just in general. So it, the recommendation is like any other adult population to increase gradually with your, with your fiber sources. Um, so the other macronutrient, protein. Protein recommended 20 to 25% of calories. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more. 0.8 grams per kilogram of weight per day is what the RDA states. But we know that the elderly need more protein. They want, well they might get one, but they, we want for their muscle mass to be preserved. So getting enough protein is really, really important. And unfortunately, while they may not be eating as much as we hope they'd be eating, protein is usually a food item um, that they don't consume because of the consistency. <laughs> Beef, chicken, um, <clears throat> fish not so much, turkey, they're drier meats, they're harder to chew, they're, they don't necessarily smell as good as some other foods, so they tend to not be eaten as regularly as we hope so. So getting other protein sources is really important and encouraging them to eat um, not only the uh, chicken, turkey, beef, but also fish, um, eggs, peanut butter, as long as there's no swallowing issues, peanut butter can be hard, of course. Uh, protein is really something to focus on maybe at, during your snack parts or something to add in as opposed to just a, a carbohydrate, like a granola bar, there's not a whole lot of protein in there. Um, so protein in little bits can help with overall protein intake. And then fat. We want our elderly residents to make sure they're getting enough fat um, in their diet. And of course, saturated fat is the type of fat that you want to limit. Um, but monounsaturated fat, hopefully, uh, whomever's preparing the foods in your facility is using an olive oil type base. Um, encouraging use of salad dressings or anything that is the monounsaturated type of fat. Um, cholesterol, although I have it up there, we know that especially research recently has shown that the dietary cholesterol is not necessarily the problem with your level of cholesterol in your blood. So limiting the amount of eggs that somebody is consuming is not really the greatest approach. And if they're consuming eggs, let them eat eggs. Put cheese in it, put meat in it, put vegetables in it. Um, try to think outside of the box with uh, encouraging just intake in general. Um, so vitamins and minerals, the micronutrient needs, uh, Although their bodies are slowing down, a lot of their micronutrient needs remain the same. So they need the same amount of vitamin B, that, or vitamin B6 or vitamin B12, whichever vitamin B you choose, that they did when they were 50. 
So if they're not eating as much, you really need to figure out foods that are nutrient dense, that have a higher bang for their buck. Um, <clears throat> iron, iron can be a concern for individuals if they're not eating a lot of uh, meat products or have um, GI disturbances if they're uh, not necessarily eating iron but then are supplementing with iron, that can be a problem. Um, the concern with supplementing vitamins and minerals is we know that they're already on a whole lot of other medications. So the desire is for them to get the vitamins and minerals that they need through their diet. Um, and that's done through a well-balanced diet um, throughout the day. Fluid intake. So elderly aren't drinking enough and it's because maybe they're no, they don't remember, their bodies don't tell them that they're thirsty. Um, they have decreased mucosa, they have decreased uh, saliva production, so they're not as thirsty, but their bodies still need that fluid. Eight, out, eight, eight ounce glasses of fluid a day, and that can be difficult, especially if somebody's uh, on like a thick and liquid product. So figuring out other food products that maybe count as liquid, so soup or popsicles or other beverages that don't seem like the same old thing can really help maintain um, fluid. Hydration card. Does anybody have hydration cards? No? A couple? Yay! Do they, I mean, how are they? Are they successful? Do they work? Yeah, we have them on hands, and we've got lemons, and they look pretty. Oh, good. Well, looking pretty is part of the deal. So hopefully if they look pretty, then people are more likely to drink some of the products. Anybody else? So, yes, have you had a good experience with the hydration cards? I mean, are, are people drinking more? Yes, yes. And that's the key, just keeping it at, um, on the front of people's minds so that, oh yeah, I should be drinking a little bit more. And it helps with the staff, to remind the staff that that's something, you know, although it's another thing that we have to encourage the residents to do or for us to chart, it, it's really important. Um, so I want everybody just to take a second and think, what is mealtime for you? Not at your facility, not, um, not anywhere else, but what does mealtime mean for you in your home? A sense of community. A sense of community. Thank you for yelling. That's good. Anybody else? Social time. Social time. I'm sorry, I heard a couple more things. <coughs> Yummy. Yummy. Happy. 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 <coughs> Sharing. Sharing. So mealtime is more than just calories in or food in. It's a social time. It's a time to be with your family and your friends to learn about, you know, what's going on in their day, to learn about how they did in PT, um, how, what else is going on. You know, I mean, the conversation is a little bit different in the long-term care facility, but it still needs to be that conversation. There still needs to be that home and friendly environment because we know that's a huge, um, great thing, huge thing that really impacts people's nutrition and appetite. Um, so what does mealtime look like? Everything is white? No, not in your home it's not. Well, maybe if you like love white. But... <laughs> Probably not. So, how many facilities have white plates, white tablecloths, white walls? It's not very conducive to a home-like environment. So, I know a lot of facilities have made changes and have painted the walls and have made it a little more friendly, but continue to do so. Continue to... Um, 
update. You don't want flowers that you can see the dust that have collected on top of them. I mean, that's kind of gross. Uh, what is, or who is needed at mealtime? So maybe in your home you don't need additional assistance, but having the staff on hand that can help with mealtime as opposed to just sit there and feed somebody within 10 minutes, right? Trying to think about mealtime as an enjoying time and um, some point to be more social as opposed to, okay, John, Joe, and Bob all need help with feeding. They can eat. Sit here and feed them until they're done. And hurry up because you have to get it done within a manageable time. Which, although that's the reality, trying to refocus can really help not only the staff, but also, also the residents. They see themselves as more of a whole person as opposed to just, oh yeah, I can't eat. They have to feed me. Um, and research has been shown that if a staff member doesn't take the time to really use that resident's capabilities, if they're still able to get that food almost to their mouth, then you want to give them time to get that food almost to their mouth as opposed to, oh, you're taking much, too much time, I'm just going to feed you anyways. Because then when you lose it, you lose it. It takes that much more time to get that function back. So maybe um, staggering meal times, depending on how your facility is and where your um, meal times happen, it, you just have to kind of think about different things. Um, and then what obstacles and barriers exist at meal time? Noise, medications, right? Although you're not necessarily supposed to be passing meds at meal time, it, it happens. Anything else? No. Um, another thing that you can encourage is families and residents to come to mealtimes and just sit and eat. And depending on how your structure is set up, um, providing a meal for the family member. I mean, not, a, not only, I mean, it would cost a little bit more for the facility, but that's one meal. And that's encouraging social socialization, including family on how their, their family member may be eating, and they know mom or dad best, so maybe they can um, notice signs of eating issues before any staff member can. So we know that intake's not optimal in most of our residents. That statistic at the beginning, 45 to 85 percent, or 54, excuse me, 54 to 85 percent of our elderly residents are malnourished. So how do we improve intake? So there's four kind of quadrants, environment, um, food access, supplements, and education. So environment, we kind of, I talked about this again um, before, but thinking of different things that you can make that are of minimal cost, but really improve the environment. Um, flowers on the table, different tablecloths, different colors of plates. I mean, that's something so that it's not only more visually appealing, but those individuals that have um, vision impairment may be able to see the plate better and distinguish the plate from the food. Um, lighting, music, while you don't necessarily want to let the staff choose the music, um, you can have a, a CD that's calming or let, you know, the residents choose what music they like to listen to. Um, finger foods, oh, sorry, that's not what it is. Um, anything else, any other ideas that you can in really improve the environment? Anything that you guys are doing that I don't have up here? No? Okay. Okay, so food access. 
And when I talk about food access, I really mean our individuals getting the food that they need. So if they're on a consistency modified diet, are they being provided that consistency modified diet? Um, ensuring that that's happening. If they have issues with silverware, or maybe you have a dementia unit, finger foods may be a better choice. Um, things that they can just pick up, maybe they don't necessarily have to be sitting, maybe they're kind of up and around. Well, at least there's some form of nutrition at the table that they can pull and grab and, and go. Um, knowing a resident's likes and dislikes. This is really important because I've seen so many residents get frustrated with having a provider come and put a plate in front of them and they have told them time and time again that they don't like peas. And every time there's peas on the menu, they get served peas. So having options for the residents, options greatly improves intake. And it can be a, a cost constraint, but um, it really improves overall attitude, intake, nutrition status, um, energy dense foods. So foods that are going to have a good amount of protein, fat, vitamins and minerals. Um, and moving on. Education and training. Does it, raise your hand if there is any education or training that you all have in your facilities for food service workers just about the residents, how to approach the residents, how to, um, you know, address them with their food concerns or likes and dislikes. Does anybody? Sort of. Okay, we half here. Can I pick on you? Sure. Okay. How is, who provides the training, first of all? Our director of community engagement, our human resources, and some other people on the team, including the nurse manager, all collaborate. Awesome. And do you feel that the people that are provided the training are kind of go the extra step? You can see a difference as opposed to just putting the plate down and going along their way? Absolutely. We always offer what's on the menu first, and if somebody mm -hmm. doesn't like salad, we never put salad on the plate because we know they're not going to eat it anyway. We sit down, the staff sit down with our residents at a dining room table to all eat together and we engage in conversation, and it's not just a here you go feed yourself kind of deal. We sit down and it's a social time for us to engage with the residents. Awesome. That is like the goal, right there. To not only have the residents being social, but the, the staff being social with them and enjoying the meal with them, if that's possible. Uh-huh. How do you feel about the setting where most people are working from home? Mm-hmm. Is it more comfortable Well, it depends on if that group of individuals uh, have appropriate dentition to eat the apples and the oranges. Well, I guess my problem is, I'll probably be 100 and I'll see them, but I probably won't have teeth and I can't use a knife, they wouldn't let me. Mm -hmm. How could I eat that? Right. I mean, the frustration is what I see. Sure. So, Although the thought of apples and oranges is fine because it's a, it's a snack, it's not getting at um, your ability to eat the apples and oranges. So maybe thinking about those squeezable apple sauces that are, you know, geared towards kids, but why not? Right? You'd still get some other snacks that are more appropriate. Yes.
Yes. Right. Yes. So a lot of changes um, may or may not be just due to the aging process. So that's where individual consultation is important and knowing that although she's 106, her swallowing is just fine. So she's going to eat that banana. Um, but if you don't know your residents, that that's going to happen. Oh, she's she clearly can't swallow that banana. Let's mash it up for her. Um, but maybe switching the apples and oranges to bananas and cutting them in half and having applesauce or, um, you know, crackers or something that's more manageable. So the fourth quadrant, um, I turn supplements, which I don't necessarily care for supplements, although they, they can be effective if uh, needed. So for those individuals that aren't eating enough, thinking of ways to really increase the calories, not necessarily the vitamins or the minerals, but just the calories. So adding a little extra butter to their oatmeal or adding whipped cream to their dessert, thinking about ways, brown sugar, butter, things that can be added and really provide more calories without a whole lot of extra costs and without an additional supplement, they can eat it at mealtime and still get more calories in that they need. So, you know, they don't have continued weight loss or their wounds will still heal. Um, a little bit of exercise for the elderly can go a long way. So maybe before mealtime, there's studies that show if you do a little bit of exercise, it doesn't have to be a lot, before mealtime, their appetite goes up. And that can be anything from going outside and um, just catching some of the sun or doing a little bit of physical activity in, in the chairs or with the um, activities director. Does anybody have kind of scheduled exercise for their residents? Yes? That's awesome. Other things, um, you know, supplements are okay, so I'm thinking about like the Ensure or um, other products that uh, can really give you that bang for your buck, but again, it's not food. So if an individual's um, ordered to have supplements, then that can um, exchange the food. You know, they're not going to necessarily eat the food and they might drink the supplement instead, which isn't what we want to happen. So what else can be done? Um, identifying those who are at risk. So really knowing, again, your residents, individualizing their nutrition plan, um, and recognizing who may be at risk, and really contributing as a team in that whole interdisciplinary healthcare team model, um, recognizing those at meal times. It's not necessarily going to be the dietitian or the nurse or the physician. It's going to be the aides and the individuals that care for them around the clock. Um, anybody can identify those at risk. And then what are you going to do next? So you would see that Joe is not eating as much. Maybe his, his clothes are a little bigger in the past few days when you've helped dress him or um, you know, his axillary, you know, his skin looks really dry. So identifying that as a problem and then, of course, connecting them with uh, proper care. So identifying the nurse and then the nurse and the physician and, and the dietitian to put in uh, appropriate intervention. In place. <coughs> Next steps. So hopefully at this point all facilities have a liberal diet. Everybody can eat the same food, unless they, of course, are on texture modifications. But there shouldn't be any no added salt, uh, 1,800, 2,000 calorie diets, 
Um, the only one that may still exist, which is still out for debate, is if somebody's um, on that brink of receiving dialysis or not. So their diet may be a little bit different. Um, but you really should not be limiting their intake by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and allowing that autonomy to continue. So our uh, example over here of the 106-year-old lady who still wanted her banana not mashed up, that's an example of letting her do what she would like to do. And she was safe to swallow, that's completely fine. Um, ensuring likes and dislikes are known, establishing a support system. So you recognize something's going on, you kind of monitor it, and then you put the proper uh, things in place to really intervene at an appropriate time before things get uh, too bad where you can't. And then proper medication management. A lot of times, you know, although they're on 15 medications, if they're not eating, they're not absorbing those medications. Those medications are not doing what, they're, what they were meant to be doing. So that can be in and itself just something that helps Joe the rest of his day because he feels better because he's eating and the medications are being properly um, metabolized, digested, and absorbed. I've listed some resources here that uh, I think are helpful. Tufts University has come out with a new adjusted, they had an older MyPlate for elderly, but they've come out with a, a freshened up MyPlate for elderly uh, based on the 2015-2020 dietary guidelines. So um, I encourage you to post that in your, in your dining room and ensure that that's happening and making um, maybe some changes to your menu including some more whole grains in your menu, um, fruits and vegetables, making them accessible. A bowl of apples and oranges for a bunch of elderly residents isn't probably the most accessible way to add fruits and vegetables to your meals um, or even throughout the day. If you can, stagger meal times or give people more opportunities to eat as opposed to the dining room's only open for 30 minutes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then it's closed. Well, that's not really helping people eat as much as you know we want them to eat, encouraging their appetite. A lot of times, um, research has shown that individuals do better if they can kind of graze throughout the day. You know, a big plate of food is overwhelming for certain people, and they may not eat at all. So if it's just a half a sandwich as opposed to a whole sandwich, maybe they can have the rest of that sandwich in a couple of hours and let that food digest because it takes longer to digest. It takes longer to move through the system. And you can see uh, references if you would like to do some fun reading on a Friday night. And uh, are there any questions? We have 10 minutes and we have no questions, so this could be a long, scary process. <laughs> sure. I'm going to stare at you. I feel like I should could get a question out of you. No. Just kidding. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, oh, yay! One question, you get the door prize. Get a door. Eat more fruits and vegetables. That's your door prize. I have a vegetable that you sent us today. In relationship to the gentleman who gave the speech, Kim Proch, Mm -hmm. pro, pro, pro. Yeah. Uh, I heard on him on NPR the other day. Um, and he was talking about um, um, advanced directives and things when you're, when you're working on trying to have the other talk and to get your 
get your affairs in order. Sure. Um, and it just it came to me when you were talking, um, you know, about this that part of what this um, preparation uh, for when things get to a point where you don't have all that control, that part of that planning can also be kind of a dream list or a preference list mm -hmm. that you could have as an addendum, such as, I really like to have that little piece of dark chocolate book right after dinner with my little half a cup of milk, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and if you can be specific like that and have that down there, I would just think that if you are then in some kind of a, uh, an assisted or a, a, a care facility, that is trying to figure out what to do to get you to eat, <laughs> then you have it already written out. That's a great so, idea. Um, wish list. I, 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 uh, yeah, I, that's a great idea. Wish list, a, a bucket list maybe, if you will, um, of, of different things that you would really, really like if it, it came to that. Like I like mandarin oranges, but it's really hard to get through peeling an orange. Mm -hmm. but mandarin oranges go down so smoothly and they look good on yogurt and cottage cheese and things like that so that people um, can know um, and it would help them. It help them in terms of being able to have the kinds of products available. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Um, and that made me think of something else. Uh, if you can offer some form of social hour for the residents that that can partake in a, in a glass of wine or, or a beer, it can really improve intake. Um, nobody's encouraging them to get drunk in the there. You know, oh, they're getting drunk in there. No, it's, it's something social, and if if you're able to do that, that I've heard that that has great success too. Uh huh. Yes, and, and by no means did I mean for this to say that it's, it's easy to feed the vast amount of individuals that you all serve. Um, depending on the individual, um, I'll go back to even a low sodium diet is, is really not recommended at this point. Even for um, that person that has extensive hypertension or congestive heart failure, um, we want them to have no limits and just be able to eat. So, but then somebody maybe that celiac disease, of course they want to avoid gluten, but there are some individual um, exceptions, but in general, we don't want to uh, limit food intake, and especially we don't I remember seeing people put food down and then realize that it was for the wrong resident and then take it away. <laughs> ah, no. <laughs> I mean, that just causes a whole lot of concerns and problems. So avoiding that as much as possible. It, um, but then knowing your residents too. Where, where is the compromise? Because what I'm witnessing is residents who are paralyzed on the left side and have partial paralysis on the right side and their utensils are wrapped in a napkin that they're supposed to unwrap and the, that napkin is not a protective a clothing protector and they're very embarrassed because they don't want any food on their clothing and I've seen people not eat as a result of that so I'm all for clothing protectors but I call them bibs so I don't know where the rest of the civilization is, but it's very hard to sit there. Maybe they don't want you to feed them. You can cut up their food, but why doesn't a facility provide decent protectors? Because they're very embarrassed and they don't want the food on their clothing. 
I, that's a great point. Um, whenever individuals have mobility issues and, and can't get the food to their mouth and they're, and they're really trying, um, I would address it with the staff. I mean, that's a whole interdisciplinary um, issue. So OT should be aware that the silverware is not maybe uh, accessible for the residents. That's a red flag for me. Um, also, the clothing protectors or whatever, you know, they're called. I mean, if they're not available or there's not enough, then, then that's a concern. I mean, it's much as a concern as not having enough sheets or blankets or, or medication. I mean, it, it has to deal with their overall health and, and their quality of life. Any other questions? I only see a few people nodding off, so that's good. Okay. So <laughs> thanks for your attention. Okay. Um,